because he had been God's spokesman. He had been faithful and true to what God commanded him to do in spite of the circumstances. When you look back on some of these great prophets' lives, what did they fear? People will reject the word of God and they tried to kill them. Because if you look, when Elijah went into, was taken up by a chariot into heaven, his protege, Elisha, went out and got on a big rock. And the king was sick in the bed and he sent a captain with 50 to come get him. He was going to influence the word of God. And that captain of 50, the first cast group came, was going to take him down off the rock, and he prayed to God and asked God to consume them in fire. And what happened? They were consumed with fire. We know a second 50 come to take that prophet and put words in his mouth to make the king look good. And what happened to the second 50? He prayed and they were consumed by fire. Okay, three strikes, you're out. Because he sent another 50. You know, so but what happened with this 50? This captain knew that something was great, okay? He knew that this was God's spokesman by the events that took place. Okay, he didn't have to go ask somebody else. He knew because these hundreds were gone. So he approached Elijah in a more respectful way. He told him, you know, you can have me consumed by fire. Would you please come down on this rock and just tell the king what's going to happen to him? The king had been stricken sick, laying in the bed, and I need to move on. And when Elijah came in from before him, uh, you got to understand this is the king. He has power over life and death. Would you have told the king what he wanted to hear? Most people would. Most people are going to tell the king what, what he wants to hear because of his power <coughs> over life and death. But who has true power over life and death? Elijah the king. <coughs> and he didn't tell the king what he wanted. He said, In this day you're going to die and have dead. Because you've been apart from God, you've not followed God. And what happens? He died. So you see the word of God being fulfilled, true, day in and day out, right? Now I know y'all think I'm chasing rabbits, and that's a good thing. Because that, that's two people I'm going to talk about, all right? So we just sang about the king, right? His birth, his coming. Well, what was his purpose? I know I got to attend the graduation of my grandson at Paris Island. He graduated Marine Corps. And what was he doing on Paris Island? He was training for the military. He was training for physical conduct, to be physically strong, <coughs> to be mentally strong, and to learn the ways of the military and how to conduct himself and how to wage war. That's a terrible thing to think about. That's what you're training for. But that's what he's training for. And then when he leaves Paris Island, he goes on to another form of training, right? The actual hands-on combat training. Okay, for combat. So keep that little nugget in mind because we're going to go to Jesus transfigured. And you'll understand why I had to talk about Moses and Elijah. And I'm going to read this to you. This, I'm going to leave, read Luke's account of it in chapter 9, starting at verse 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there come with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. And here you have Elijah, which is foretold in Scripture, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and several other places in the Old Testament. Okay. Here you have their foretelling the coming of Christ. Here you have Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah and being transfigured. He carried these three men onto the mountain, and I got to thinking and praying about that thing this week, and I said, why just the three? Why not all play? Because one of them was great. One of them might have been like me. I like to put this off on running at three lines of communications in the world. There's a telephone, a telegraph, Hell, brother. 
<laughs> and I, I figured that for a lot of the day. Okay? But you get my point, okay? And the reason I bring that up is because if you read on in the story, it says this. Then I'm going to read the very last verse to tie this in. And i got to go back, okay? And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Why? For the time. For the time. It was the time. Remember what I asked you about a king? When the children of Israel were looking for a king to come, what were they looking for? What, were they, what was their carnal envision of a king? Think about that a minute. A king was somebody in high authority with great power. Their vision of the king they wanted was to come in, overthrow the Romans, reestablish the temple worship, and put them in power. They would be great in the kingdom of God, except for one thing. They weren't following God. They had taken simple ten commandments and turned them into three hundred commandments. If every time I turn around I know the ten commandments and somebody keeps adding and adding and adding to it, can you, I can't remember three hundred things. I can tell you that now. Okay, my wife do that all this week. Okay? Got in the truck this morning to run all the gas out of it on the way back from eating. And, uh, <coughs> I finally learned to punch some of the buttons on the steering wheel, and then he comes up and he gives it tire pressure and mileage, and then he comes to a little train that says fuel range. And as we were leaving Remember Church Road this morning, I punched that little button up. I thought, oh, this thing is on empty and dinging, you know, the little gas pump signs coming on. So I punched it up, and it said I had 53 mile range. Okay, we can make it up to the fill station. We'll be all right. We'll get to church on time. What came out from his mouth? You can't believe that thing. I think, you know, because they don't know. I said, well, they put it on the vehicle for that reason. Yeah, but I didn't ask for it. He just came with it. Okay. So if you're not going to believe the message that is given, what good is it? Okay. So you look at the children of Israel, and Moses and Elijah, and the coming of God. They were looking for a king to restore them to their power, the carnal power. They controlled everything that was going on. That's not what Jesus was about. That's not what he intended to do. I get tickled at that because I know I want to instill Frank's way. You know, I worked for a man who told me there were three ways to do things. <clears throat> I got a friend here that a test to it. He said there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And in this instance, it was easy way. And his comment was to us, around here we do things easy way. Well, that's in great contradictory to the word. Look at the children of Israel. The, the Sanhedrin. The high council. The priests. The Sadducees. The Pharisees. These people knew the Old Testament. Most of them had memorized it. They could quote Deuteronomy word for word from beginning to end. So they weren't ignorant. But their vision of what God was going to accomplish was different from what God was going to do. I read this little commentary on it, and this would be verse 9 and 26. And Luke's giving you this vision. It says that Luke's Greek audience would have found it difficult to understand a God who could die. Think about that a minute. We know from past sermons that we've had and past things we've taught, we know that the Ark of Covenant was captured by the Philistines, put in the temple with Daggett. What happened to Daggett? First night he fell over. Fell over face first down in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Did that signify a greater God? So we see the, the worshipers come in, set Daggett back up on his place, and the Ark of the Covenant is still there. And what happened the second time? Dagon fell again. So this time Dagon was head and arms broken off. So he received damage. As pagan people had enough sense to know that that little box and what it contained was powerful, was strong. And they got it out of there with Dagon. Why? Because Dagon was stone and he could not. They didn't understand the power of a God that loved people, his children so much. 
he brought them out of captivity. Think about that a little bit. What was Jesus doing for you and I? He died on a cross to bring us from being lost to salvation. He died on a cross to make sure that we as people could come and have fellowship with him. We are joint heirs with Christ. Amen. When you hear that little verse in the Synoptic Gospels, where John the Baptist is baptizing and then Jesus comes down to the water to be baptized, and John tells him, I'm not unworthy to come back to your sandals. And John was pretty high. Was he not in God's eyes? And they baptized him and he came up, the dove appeared, and what came out of heaven? This is my beloved son, and whom I am well pleased. So you've got God's stamp of approval. Where else did that take place? Look at the, I'm not going to call it an impossible servant, Stephen. Stephen was chosen out of a certain church, out of seven chosen, to minister to the widows and orphans in that church. He was not a member of the original 12 disciples. You God's word, he was willing to serve. And he preached to the Sanhedrin a message they didn't want to hear. Going back to the law. The law said that if he claimed he'd last seen God, they had to write on the law to what? Stone him to death. Well, think about that a minute. Now here you've got this great council up here that had the power by interpreting the Ten Commandments to stone Stephen. Well, why did they stone him? Because, man, he stood up in their midst and told them what was going on. And that, you can look at it in the books of Acts 6 and 15, it talks about his face shining. But if you read that chapter before, it tells you that Stephen gives you a great message of Jesus Christ. His coming, his preaching, his healing, his teaching. And they rejected it. They reject it. Why? Because their vision of a coming Savior and King was not what they wanted. If you go back and study the Word, it says we are followers of Moses, not followers of God. So that, that you see the failing in the air of the way it's right there. Because God sent the commandment. Moses didn't send the commandment. Moses was just a vessel that he used to communicate. Okay? So let's go back to the transfiguration then. What is the importance of you have Jesus being transfigured? Those three disciples seeing him in his glory and the glory kingdom of the glory of God by the representation of the change. It says that his garments were so shiny his skin and hair and stuff was white as wool. Uh, and one instance you can find this in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. One said that it was so bright that the fuller of the earth could not clean it and make it that white. The fuller being uh, an agent something like bleach. If you want to get your t-shirt white, you add bleach to the wash, do you not? And it should restore the color of that t-shirt back to white. So if you look at this, what is the significance of the disciples being there? They seeing this transformation of God. They actually seeing the Son of God. Okay? They're literally seeing into heaven. They're seeing this Son of God and into heaven to see God. And what does he say? This is my beloved Son. Hear him. So the message hadn't changed, had it not? So I got to thinking about that thing. Why not just Moses the lion? Why not King David? Why not Noah? They didn't represent what Jesus was trying to show these men that they were going to stand for, they were going to preach for, and they were going to die for. He knew their heart. He knew the content of their heart. And that's the difference. When you look at these three men that were appearing there, it was painting in a picture so that they could understand. 
What did Moses represent? The Mosaic Covenant, the law. And they failed. What did Elijah represent? It represented the prophets, the prophecy of being foretold. What happened to the prophets? And it beat killed. And didn't listen to them. So you see the fallacy of me, and I'll use me because I don't step on anybody else's toes. I'm not following the prophets. I'm not hearing them and what God's saying. I hear what Frank wants to hear. That's what my wife accuses me of. I've got very selective here. Okay? So we know that through the prophets they rejected them and went about their own way. When you look at Moses, they did not follow the Ten Commandments. Had we followed the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need for Christ to come. So you're seeing the two failed attempts to save and rescue me. If you go back and read in some of the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it says that before the beginning of the world, God said to Jesus, set him aside. Why? And I, I thank Wendy for that. I got the answer to a little song she can let us sing about a day, sister. Because God knew that I was going to fall. Yes. God knew I was going to fail. And He loved me so much, He did what was necessary to save me and to rescue me. Yes. And that was a big feat. Because I still need saving and rescue. And I can go off the rail and just drop the ladder. <coughs> I can come on the you know, I had heard that saying that I, I love to give somebody a piece of my mind. Well, I'm getting to the age now, I don't have, to have enough mind left to give any away. I got to try to salvage something. Okay? So you think about that. Why was this so important to these three men? What happened to Peter? Peter was crucified. That was the form of death that the Romans gave to folks that weren't civil. It was cruel. It was painful. It was long. Peter said, I'm not worthy to even be crucified. He didn't say, I didn't want to die. He didn't say, I want to run. But for preaching the word of God, for standing up for God, God gave him the strength through what he saw. He knew who Jesus was. There was no doubt about it. Because he was willing to die for it. And we know that Peter went on to be crucified. The some will say he was crucified upside down. Because he's unworthy to hang on that tree. Like that. <coughs> that Jesus did. Now that's respect, is it not? That is a grasp and an understanding of a living God that most of us miss. When they were stoning Stephen, Stephen had a unique experience. Because he was dying being stoned, and I doubt them stones hit him felt very good. But it says he looked up and he looked into heaven. And what happened to his face? He actually saw God. He actually saw in the kingdom where he was headed to very shortly. It says his face was like an angel. Well, what's the face of an angel? It's God. Okay, so you're seeing a man that was chosen to serve. He's willing to serve. He faced the Sanhedrin and, and the council and the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the mother's followers. And they claimed he was blasphemous to God. And through that blasphemous, they had the right to stone him to death because they disagreed with him. And they did. Who was attending that stoning? Paul. Saul was the word he was there before God changed his name. Was standing there and see me. They threw the coats off because I didn't want to spend a lot of work to go on when they took the coats off for a rock pad to stone him to death. And if you look at the wording in that, and I think it's up there, Acts 6 15, <coughs> it says something very unique. I'm going to read verse 
verse 15, And all that sat in the council, looking steadfast on him, saw his face that had been the face of an angel. Then drop on down to Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which are called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Syrians, the Alexandrians, and of them of Sicily and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suffered men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and called him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the holy, this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this pact and shall change the custom which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. If you back on up, you find out where they were stoning him. And Paul, who was Saul at the time before he had the Damascus Road experience, and God changed the name to Paul, was there. Peter was crucified because of not a Roman citizen. He was a Jew, an Israelite. Paul had come up under the church and under the Roman system and complained Roman citizenship. Read the word and tell you that. Okay. So Paul was in this time era right around Peter. You're looking at 68, somewhere around there, that they were to be martyred. How was Paul killed? Paul, preaching the word of God, had his done. He had a more dignified death than crucifixion. Because he was a Roman citizen. But it was hard they cut his head off. So that was more uh, merciful. Still dead. Anyway, you look at it. Why were these men killed? Why were these men willing to die for Christ? Because they knew who he was. There was no doubt in their mind who Jesus was. Christ carried them to this mountaintop and prayed. He revealed himself as the Son of God. And they believed. They knew in their heart. They saw so many signs, wonders, and miracles. Okay? That they couldn't deny it. So when I asked you a while ago about the king... These folks weren't willing to accept Christ as Lord and Savior and King because their definition of king and his kingship were two different things. They could not believe a king could die or would die. A great king was strong. A great king would raise them up and lift them up. He would destroy the Roman Empire and the evil that they saw around them and really lift them up in carnal glory. That's not what Jesus was about. So we know that they could not, their test on him was to put him on that cross. Because if he was God in their minds and their vision, once they tried to put him on that cross, his power and strength would come down and he would destroy the people crucified. But we know that didn't take place. We know it didn't take place. Because if you read the scripture back from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, it says that he came to the slaughter as a lamb. Meat. Boy, that, that sure hurt their vision of a king, did it not? That sure destroyed it. If you move on in, in the book of Luke, I want to finish reading that. Just as Jesus' Jewish audience would have been perplexed by a Messiah who would let himself be captured, both would be ashamed of Jesus if they did not look past his death to his glorious resurrection. And here's the difference. All the kings that you read about in the Bible, all the great men of God that you read about in the Bible, what happened then? They died a physical death. They were unable to raise themselves from the dead. This is what set our God apart. 
This is what set the Almighty God apart. Even though they could crucify him and kill him, God raised him from the dead. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference, folks. That's the power of Jesus Christ. That's the power of this book. That is the power that's in your heart and your life that you can access because God has conquered the grave and death. He stands alone. We see Dagon fall and get damaged just from the presence of the altar. We know that Christ suffered a cruel death. We've heard Cortez teach about the massive beating and bruising and yeah, his body. But God allowed him to go to the cross. Why? Because the commandments failed, the prophets failed, we didn't listen. But here we have the ultimate sacrifice that one and only needed now. That Christ died for all. So that all might have eternal life. Yes. So that all could have a right relationship with Him. That's the difference. That's why I think it was important for them to see Moses and Elijah at that transfiguration. Not only that, but they saw who the Son of God was. They saw Him in His glory and His They saw heaven, a better place. And as I pointed out in that military training, I think this was their spiritual training so that they could stand for Christ, stand against all the fire and darkness that will come against them to the point that they were willing to die for them. And man, that's a conviction. Okay? You want to see me wiggle and squirm, turn the heat up on me. I don't like the home table. I don't. But most people don't. If they're honest with themselves, these men were willing to die for the sake. They were going to preach the gospel in spite of the circumstances. They were going to speak the truth, even though it stepped on toes. I don't think I want to attend one Paul's sermon. And I base that upon he wrote two thirds of the New Testament. And Paul points to Jesus. Everything he says and does points to Jesus. I look at Paul and I love to read that part about that Damascus Road experience. Here's a man on fire for temple worship and for the commandments. He's got a script in his hand from the Sanhedrin that he can legally arrest and have Christians put to death. And that's what he's about. So he has a zeal to do what he thinks is right. When God confronted him, what did he say to him? Paul, why persecuted thou me? And he was blinded. You can go on to read and come to find out. Paul didn't just jump, jump off the horse and God converted him and he went preaching. It was time, three or four years worth of time that he spent learning. Training. This is a well man, well versed in the Old Testament, well educated. If you go and read the scripture, it says he was uh, one of the top in the class on the school of Daniel. Why does that matter? God's choice and God's choice is different from mine. God's love and my love are different. He loved me so much. That he died for me. He prepared a way. When you look at the failing of the commandments, why did the commandments fail? Not because God was perfect, because men are not perfect. Someone catches me doing wrong and confronts me with it, what's the first thing that'll come out of my mouth? You can tell a lie. I'm going to try to lie my way out of it. I'm going to try to work around it. No, you didn't see that. You're lying out. So we killed the prophet. <clears throat> we wanted a king and a sight that would come in so much power that it would raise me up in his arms. That's not what God is about. He came, he laid down the They didn't take it from him. To show the power of God through the resurrection. Find me any faithful book that says you serve a Savior that has power over death and the grave. One of the things I, I heard in, in a message, I didn't personally know the guy who was a Muslim and became Christian. And you know what turned me? He said, I know the 
muzzle plate. I know the writing. I came to a crossroad because I read the book Bible. And he said, what made me look and change my mind? When I got to that crossroads, I looked for Muhammad, and I saw a grave and a group tombstone on that end of the road. I looked the other way, and what did I see? I saw a living, raised Christ. And he said, it didn't take a lot of concerning and turning to realize I might have better serve this living God. And said, this one is dead here. Which one has the great power? Which one has the ability to save my very soul? And that's the question you need to ask. Who do you serve and why? God has certainly blessed me. He's given me opportunity beyond measure. I've told you my feelings about this bullpen. I don't like it. Because I'm lazy. But to get up here, I've got to get in the Word of God. I've got to read it and study it and do more than just read it as a novel. I've got to apply it in here somewhere. What is God saying to me? And it's caused me to probably grow a thousand times more than y'all listeners. Hard to believe it. I have a good friend here today that I met looking, oh my God, is this thing well I worked with 30 years ago? <laughs> But I want him to use that in a different light. Okay? He knew me when I was lost, unsaved, undone. A servant of Satan, a servant of the world. I cut the rungs off the ladder to keep somebody else from getting hired me. That was my mentality. But you can see through me, and it ought to be a great feeling to know that I can see the work of Christ in others yes. that they can change. Don't give up on me. Pray for me. And let's all grow in Christ. In His work. Amen. I love that message. It meant a lot to me. Jesus was persecuted Messiah. Jesus was blind, crucified. Why would you think you would be any different? Think about it. I love the Lord. I love this church. The church family. The church is not the building now. And the brick and the mortar. The church is the people. Yes, sir. And that's the difference. We fellowship and have love with one another. It is great. It is fun. I can pick it on me, I can pick it myself, Ryan, I can have a talk, but I do it under the influence 